straight talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. You're listening to The Jay Shapiro Show. Hello again, this is Jay Shapiro. Thanks for listening. There was a terrible tragedy in Israel last week when 45 people were killed. It was a terrible tragedy and a large number of articles were written about it here in Israel from all kinds of viewpoints. I purposely avoid commenting on it because no comment will add or distract from the tragedy. Instead, I comment on a different tragedy, one that happened more than 100 years ago, when an act of genocide was carried out by the Turkish government against the Armenian minority in Turkey. The state of Israel has ever since its founding avoided recognizing the Armenian tragedy. This was said to be because of the Jewish state's delicate position militarily and diplomatically with regard to Turkey, which was until recently an ally of Israel. So up until now, perhaps avoiding speaking of the Armenian Holocaust could be justified. It was amoral, but it could be justified for diplomatic and military reasons. In recent years, however, Turkey has changed its character and is longer, no longer the same Turkey. Perhaps the time has come to officially recognize the reality. Even the American government under Biden, to his credit, has formally recognized the reality that's been staring us in the face for a hundred years. So I say a few words about it. It's a moral conundrum that has to be resolved. I also speak about two other topics. One is the effort by various organizations like the International Criminal Court to accuse Israel of apartheid in its relationship with its Arab population. Those who accuse Israel are either ignorant of reality or simply malicious. The topic that persists despite all the facts. And I say a few words about how under the new leadership, the Jewish National Fund is resuming its historic role in redeeming the land west of the Jordan River for the Jewish people. Thanks again for listening. I'll be back after the break. The return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel was prophesied in the Bible thousands of years ago and is coming true today. Shalom. Join me, Josh Wander, on Israel Unplugged. Listen in as we delve into the spiritual and physical aspects of the Jewish return to Zion. We'll discuss the biblically mandated, historic, and of course practical understandings of this incredible transition from exile to redemption. That's Israel Unplugged. Every Monday on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. You're listening to The Jay Shapiro Show. You're back with Jay Shapiro. I want to speak about something which is pretty far under the headlines. But I think there is a moral dilemma here that has to be resolved. Um, Talking about the massacre of Armenians, there was a mass murder of an estimated one and a half million Armenians from 1915 to 1917 by the regime of the young Turks in Turkey. It's widely seen as the first genocide of the 20th century. It's also an event that has for long pricked the conscience of the Jewish people, which suffered the horrors of its own Holocaust, the worst genocide of the 20th century and of modern times. Despite the mutual experience of genocide, the state of Israel, ever since its founding, has shied away from recognizing the Armenian experience. 
Uh, this is a state of affairs that many people decry, but others assert it's been, uh, it continues to be a necessary aspect of Israel's delicate diplomatic and security uh, position. There was a uh, celebration, if that's the proper word, a commemoration is a better word, of Armenia and the American diaspora several weeks ago, and there are reports that U.S. President Joe Biden may decide to mark the day by recognizing the genocide. And in fact, both houses of the Congress did so back in 2019, and the president promised during his election campaign. I haven't, I don't know whether he's done it yet. Now, for generations, uh, measures recognizing the Armenian genocide stalled in the U.S. Congress, and presidents refrained from calling it that because they're worried about relations with Turkey. Now, the same thing happened in Israel. Here, too, Israel feared Turkish retaliation if it were to recognize these historical facts. Back in 2018, a member of Knesset proposed a bill to recognize the massacre as genocide, but the bill was canceled due to government resistance. A year later, a number of high-profile members of Knesset voiced support for the move, but again, it did not proceed due to little government support. Now, traditionally, the explanations for Israel's failure to move on this have ranged from a need to leave a door open to better ties with Turkey, to a clear government agenda that prefers Azerbaijan over Armenia. That's a whole new situation. This was made clear this past fall when Israel supplied weapons to Azerbaijan as it fought the Armenians in a disputed area called Nagorno-Karabakh. Though, you don't have, one doesn't have to come at the expense of the other. Yes, it is true, Israel has geopolitical considerations that can't be ignored, but Israel also has a moral imperative that it also can't ignore, as the people who have experienced genocide and persecution since its very founding, the Jews have a responsibility to stand with other nations who go through similar atrocities. When we uh, recite never again on Holocaust Remembrance Day, it is obviously never again for our own people. But there's nothing wrong with making it clear that we also believe that genocide should never happen to anyone as well. The first step in ensuring never again is recognizing history as it was and making clear that what happened to the, Armenia, to the Armenians was something, it was a genocide that should never happen again. Now, also, when considering geopolitics, what exactly does Israel need to fear from Turkey? Can the relationship with the Turkish president really get worse than it is right now? There is absolutely no reason to fear the uh, per Turkish president uh, Erdogan, I think that, that's how you pronounce it, E-R-D-O-G-A-N, who behaves like an anti-Semitic bully in the Middle East. Now, it is true that he recently said he would like better relations with Israel, but he still is host to Hamas leaders in Ankara in Turkey, and the ruling AKP party in Turkey still compares Israel to Nazi Germany. Turkey has claimed it wants to liberate Al-Aqsa, asserting that Jerusalem is ours, and has said that several times in the past year. The Palestine policy is our red line. That is what was said in Ankara. They said it is impossible for us to accept Israel's Palestine policies. Their merciless act against the Palestinians are unacceptable. This is a quote 
that Erdogan said back in December after Friday prayers in Istanbul. Now, Israel should, of course, explore what this rapprochement with the Turkeys might mean, but it cannot do so while ignoring its moral and historical responsibility of standing alongside the Armenians in the face of, e of evil. For the world to ensure that these atrocities don't happen again, we in Israel have to be clear about what these atrocities are. Israel needs to recognize the Armenian genocide, I believe. And it, it's a bill that is in the Knesset to recognize the Armenian genocide, and indeed it should pass. Now the situation vis-a-vis -vis Turkey is a little bit touchy. Since uh, Turkey was regarded as a strategic asset for Israel, not only was it the one friend and ally Israel had in this region, the region being one of unbridled enmity toward the Jewish state until very recently, when several other uh, Muslim states recognized Israel, uh, Turkey was also a regional power with strategic geopolitical importance. It provided Israel with an air corridor to the Far East. I myself, about uh, more than about 10 years ago, I took a trip to uh, China and uh, we changed planes in uh, Istanbul. Uh, so it, it, Turkey provides Israel with an air corridor to the Far East, as well as trade, tourism, and military cooperation. But as a nation that experienced the Holocaust, many have argued that Israel has a particular moral necessity to recognize what is widely considered to be the first genocide of the 20th century. It took place, by the way, just to, to uh, mention the facts, back in May 1915, more than 100 years ago, the Turkish parliament authorized mass deportation of Armenians from eastern Turkey to the south. And the government then alleged that the presence of the Armenians was a national security threat and under the oversight of civil and military officials, hundreds of thousands of Armenian citizens were marched to desert concentration camps. Many were massacred along the way, while others died from starvation and dehydration in the Syrian desert. Now, despite the broad recognition by historians about what happened, which essentially uh, emptied Turkey of about 90% of its Armenian population, everyone says and admits it was genocide, the first of the 20th century. Uh, however, the Turkish governments from that time until today have refused to recognize it as such. Now, it, Turkey has done something interesting. They acknowledged that large numbers of Armenians died during that period, but has insisted that there was never a centrally mandated policy of genocide. And the Turkish government has worked strenuously to deny the genocide and has threatened countries considering recognize, recognizing it with various consequences and downgraded diplomatic relations. So, situation is long placed the state of Israel in a quandary. And the truth of the matter is that Israel is a very special place. And to a certain extent, we have to be the conscience of the world. We have suffered a genocide in the 20th century, but we have to recognize that what was done to the Armenian people was a genocide. And I think the time has come. The bill is in the Knesset, you know, and when the Knesset votes for it, Israel will give official, official recognition to the Armenian genocide. I believe that Israel's moral, moral responsibility to recognize.
the the uh, genocide. By the way, the massacre of Armenians is commemorated on April 24th, and it's recognized. Other countries have recognized it. I think the time is more than overdue for Israel, the world's conscience, to recognize it. I'll be back after the break. everyone, this is Andrea Simento from Jerusalem inviting you to drop everything and join me on my show, Pull Up a Chair. We'll visit this week's quirky stories, meet fabulous guests, and discover my Israel. Together we'll laugh, shout, and explain the topics that make us say, hey, we've got to talk about that. So get comfortable and pull up a chair with me, Andrea Simento, every Thursday on Israel News Talk Radio. You're listening to The Jay Shapiro Show. In the first segment of the program, I spoke about the fact that I think the time has come for Israel to formally recognized the genocide that the Turks did against the Armenians back in 1915. But that brings up another topic. There's something called the Human Rights Watch. And they continue to accuse Israel of apartheid. The effort to demonize Israel through comparison to the legacy of the South African apartheid regime has very deep roots. It goes back to the Soviet and Arab campaigns back in the 1970s, including the infamous UN resolution declaring that Zionism is a form of racism. Now, you have this group called the Human Rights Watch. They go by its initials, HRW. And they came out with a document with an interesting title, it's a threshold crossed, Israel authorities and the crimes of apartheid and persecution. And according to the uh, Human Rights Watch, HRW, this new document is based on new material. And if you look through the document, you have the same mix of shrill propaganda, false allegations, and legal distortions marketed by the NGO network for decades. This is a 217-page publication, which includes high-quality graphics and layout. And by the way, the HRW has a $90 million budget, so money's no object. They hired a guy named Omar Shakir back in 2016, After a number of years, he was a campus activist under the heading of Apartheid Israel. He led the uh, the human rights uh, campaign, as it were, a failed effort to press uh, soccer associations to join the anti-Israel boycott and repeatedly invoke apartheid and racism when discussing Israel. So uh, this is a lengthy propaganda battle. Uh, This publication now, by releasing it, the HRW joins numerous NGOs in amplifying the International Criminal Criminal Court Prosecutor's recent decision to open investigations of Israel for war crimes, including post-1967 settlements and occupation policies. They have a 700-page document that was submitted to the International Criminal Court, uh, and it links Israel and says Israel persecutes the occupied Palestinian population, subjects them to the crimes of persecution, apartheid, and they condemn what they call Israel's effort to ensure Israeli domination. 
There also, uh, there is an organization called B'Tselem, which is essentially a Jewish organization, it's anti-Israel, and they also produce documents, and they say that Israel is a regime of Jewish supremacy from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. Mediterranean sea. Now, all these uh, anti israel organizations exploit the inherent flexibility uh, of international law because they they cl they claim things against Israel based on interpretation of the Rome Statute, which is the International Criminal Court's uh, basis. For example, this publication asserts that Israel's coercive policies amount to international forcible transfer of civilians, which is a grave breach of the laws of war. Now, these phases, these phrases. Their distortions are falsehood, and uh, they claim that there's all these kinds of inhuman acts that make up the crime of apartheid by Israel. So what they do by saying apartheid, using that word, they draw a direct line to South Africa, labeling the, the Jewish state now as inherently racist. What is the goal? The goal is to delegitimize the concept of Jewish sovereignty, regardless of borders or policies. The South African regime was characterized by cruel and systematic institutionalized dehumanization. In contrast, and notwithstanding the ongoing conflict, Israel's non-Jewish citizens have full rights, including voting for Knesset representation. Now, what these, what these anti-Israel organizations do, essentially, is they exploit the apartheid image in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And what it, what it really does, it's a cynical appropriation of the suffering of the victims of the actual apartheid regime in South Africa. Richard Goldstone, who is a former justice of the South African Constitutional Court, wrote a report in which he wrote, and I quote, In Israel there is no apartheid. Nothing there comes close to the definition of apartheid under the 1998 Rome Statute. It is unfair and inaccurate slander against Israel, unquote. Beyond South Africa, no other regime or government has been deemed to meet the international definition of apartheid. Not even murderous and oppressive regimes practicing separation based on race, religion, and gender, such as Saudi Arabia and China. So this HRW, the uh, this group, the... Uh, Human Rights Watch has continuously invoked the Israeli apartheid theme for the last 25 years, including playing a central role in a notorious anti-Semitic forum at the 2001 U.S. Durban Conference. The final declaration referred to Israel on apartheid repeatedly and called for the complete international isolation of Israel as an apartheid state. So they wrote that uh, clearly Israeli racist practice are an appropriate topic. All kinds of top officials from these organizations have repeated the apartheid and racist smears over and over again. By the way, in one of the many, exa many examples, this is really an odd one, in the context of the 2017 white supremacy march and violence in Charlottesville, Virginia, the organization tweeted a link to a propaganda piece headline, Birds of a Feather, White Supremacy, Supremacy and Zionism. And in this report, they included a picture depicting a Confederate and Israeli flag commenting, Many rights activists condemn Israel abuse and anti-Semitism. Some white supremacists embrace Israel and anti-Semitism. So the uh, 
A major addition uh, to the usual allegations is that the planned annexation of parts of the West Bank controlled by Israel under the Oslo framework uh, continues, constitutes apartheid. Uh, indeed, at the time when Israel offic Israeli officials made such statements, these anti-Semitic NGOs issued a wave of apartheid con condemnations. Now, even though the, the annexation was dropped, because the, when, uh, with the recognition, recognition by uh, several Arab countries of Israel, Israel dropped the plans to uh, annex parts of what's called the West Bank, but the condemnations remain. So, again, what this really demonstrates is the centrality of slogans over substance. The, uh, the, the, apparently, to the best of my understanding, these organizations with really nice names like Human Rights Watch, that's a great name, these people have lost, really lost their moral compass and they're issuing reports on the Israeli-Arab conflict that are helping those who wish to turn Israel into a pariah state. The, these organizations have large budgets, they have large visibility, and they want to delegitimize Israel, and they continue in these efforts. And it is really very sad, I find it extremely sad, that these organizations still exist, they are totally uh, choose to, for probably anti-Semitic reasons, they choose to ignore the status of the Arabs here in Israel. If I go out, uh, after I do this program today, well, my recording, I'll probably, probably go out to lunch with my wife at a... Uh, at a restaurant where the waiters and some of the people behind the, in the kitchen are Arabs. They come probably from East Jerusalem. The Arabs are well integrated into Israeli society. Calling Israel an apartheid state really is a terribly false condemnation, and anyone who does it should be, should be called to task for it. You can see what's happening here since the war back in 1967, where we've, we've absorbed tens of thousands, millions of Arabs who are not citizens of the state, and they live quite well. I'll be back after the break. Are you interested in transforming your life, drawing closer to the Creator, and uncovering the deeper meanings and hidden treasures in the Hebrew Bible? Then join me, Rav Yitzhak Michelson, and me, William Hall, on the Science of Kabbalah, where we are seeking to narrow the gap between what we understand of our physical and spiritual worlds. So make sure to tune in every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Israel Time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on Israel News Talk Radio. Hello, I am Walter Bingham. If you want to hear the news behind the news and the true perspective on world affairs, then The Walter Bingham File is the program for you. We bring you interviews with the movers and shakers, political commentaries, and on-the-spot reports of events as they happen. All here every Tuesday, 4 p.m. Israel Time, 9 a.m. Eastern Time. And it's all archived on our website. Make it a date. You're listening to The Jay Shapiro Show. You're back with Jay Shapiro. The first two segments of my program this week were pretty heavy. One I spoke about uh, genocide, the other I spoke about anti-Semitism. So I decided to lighten up a little bit in this final segment with some little items that are under the headlines. They're in the paper, 
maybe on page 10 or 12, but they're interesting and I think people should know about them. For example, um, the uh, ele- it turns out that, that elephants lived in Israel for over 1.5 million years before becoming extinct. Prehistoric humans in this region, which is now Israel, shared their habitat with these big elephants, hunting, but also respecting them. This is uh, two uh, professors, one from Tel Aviv University uh, and another from, uh, I guess it's pronounced La Sapienza University in Rome. Uh, there was They gave lectures at the Tel Aviv Institute for Italian Culture about two or three weeks ago, and they spoke about the elephants. Now, according to the professors, throughout hundreds of thousands of years, people were eating elephants. And for this purpose, they developed specific tools. They explained that the big mammals lived in Israel as early as two million years ago, and they went extinct for unknown reasons about 400,000 years ago. They were straight tusk elephants, twice as big as modern elephants. And this is very interesting, at least I found it interesting. In the consideration of the large number of calories that ancient humans needed, which is like between three and 5,000 every day, they didn't sit in all day long in front of Zoom. So elephants represented a unique nutritional opportunity. Likely, not more than one or two elephants a year were hunted by little groups, and a single animal would sustain the whole crowd for a long time. And uh, the professors said that they, would, they can make comparisons with contemporary Arctic populations. Today, they kill a whale per year, and it supports them throughout the winter. Uh, so now they found in the site of Rivadin, which is a region in southern Israel, researchers excavated hundreds of flint tools and elephant remains. However, the dietary aspect represented only one side of the interaction between ancient people and ancient animals. If I pronounce it right, they were called proboscideans. Now they have archaeological evidence that shows that there was a special relationship between humans and elephants. The two species presented several similarities. They take care of each other, they educate their young, and they mourn their dead. I didn't know that, this, that elephants mourn their dead, but this is, this is news to me. So uh, one of the professors said he believes that ancient humans noticed it in the same way than modern researchers do. There is artwork depicting elephants. They've been uncovered in Europe and also in Israel. And also, archaeologists have excavated artifacts made of elephant elephant bones, which were replicas of the stone tools ancient humans used to butcher the elephants. So so here we had uh, elephants living here in Israel now 1.5 million years ago, so uh, that's something that's nice to know. Uh, okay, and now the next item, which is under the headlines. The next item, which is also under the radar, but I think it's much more serious. Uh, many Israelis know of the Karen Kayemet Le Israel Jewish National Fund because they do a breathtaking job of uh, building national parks and nature reserves here in Israel. Now, most Jews living outside of Israel know it know, know this uh, Karen Kayemet, uh, KKL, we call it, but, uh, KKL JNF. They're known for the charity boxes, collecting money to plant trees in Israel. That's been going on for years. I remember them as a child. This is the this this has contributed it's, uh, to beautifying the country. They plant zillions of trees. Uh, Israel is the only country on earth, by the way, that started the 21st century with more trees than it had at the beginning of the 20th century. So, if you're ever in a contest, they want to know 
what country is the only one with more trees than it had 100 years ago? That's Israel, and it's due to the Karen Kayemet. Now, these activities are aesthetically pleasing and environmentally friendly, are really not the main mission of the KKL. They are only complementary to the mission it was established to pursue because it was formed at the time of Theodor Herzl for the explicit purpose of purchasing and developing our ancestral lands for Jewish reestablishment. Now, the current chairman is a fellow named Avraham Duvani, who I know uh, personally. He's known friendly friends call him Duvdov. Uh, he's the chairman of the Karen Kayama, and he set out to formalize the process in which the organization purchased land in Judea and Samaria. So what happened was a lot of progressive Jews have done everything in their power to reverse this decision. The, uh, to the point that Benny Gantz, a member of Knesset, the head of the Central Left Blue and White Party, publicly called on Duvivani to exercise caution because of potential backlash this decision, buying property in Judea and Samaria, might get a bad backlash from American Jewry. Now, how did Duvivani respond? He said he's not reinventing the wheel. In fact, he's doing exactly what the current Kayama was established to do back in 1901 and continued to do ever since. So why do these so-called progressive Jews have a problem with buying land in Judea in Samaria? So presumably, it's not a rejection of the Jewish people's right to redeem ancestral land. It hardly be progressive to champion the Jewish people's right to return and rebuild the ruins of places in Israel like Tzvat, Safed, only to demonize the return and building of a place like Bet El, which is in the West Bank. Now, the uh, it's interesting. These progressive Jews um, are moved, rightfully, by the Sioux nation, Sioux Indians, have a fight to defend their ancestral lands in places in North and South Dakota. Why, do, do they not believe the Jewish brethren had the right to purchase and build homes in, Eugene, in Jude, Judean hills? In other words, if the Indians, Indians have a right to their ancestral lands in uh, North and South Dakota, why do the Jews have any less right to their ancestral lands here in the Holy Land? Well, the current Kayama has explicitly stated that it can only purchase privately owned land in Area C, uh, which is the area given to the Jews in Judea and Samaria. The truth of the matter is that we need to wake up. Liberation of the heartland of Eretz Israel in 1967, which was swiftly followed by the return of Jews and a repopulation of villages formerly ethnically clean of Jews, even recently by the Jordanian army, is not the reason for Palestinian Arab suffering. That is a complicated issue with much of the blame lying at the feet of the so-called two-state solution paradigm and the corruption of Mahmoud Abbas-fed Palestinian authority. Both, both of which have left the Palestinian Arab masses without a legitimate government to support them. But none of these issues will be remedied by denying the Jewish people the right to purchase land in the indisputable heart of its indigenous homeland and highest concentration of sacred sites. Indigenous rights are human rights. We can and we must support the continued purchase and development of land and the realization of a 2,000-year struggle for Jewish self-determination and freedom, while all the while demanding an end to the perpetual abuse suffered by Palestinian Arabs at the hands of the Palestinian Authority and those within the Israeli government who misguidedly justify its existence. 
I believe that Duvani made the right decision, consistent with the true values of liberalism. Zionism and the Jewish National Fund mandate was to serve as a bridge rather than a barrier to achieving the Zionist dream. And I think we have responsibility to keep it that way. The Jewish National Fund was created in order to essentially bring the Jewish homeland back into the hands of the Jewish people. That's the bottom line, no matter how you slice it. And Duke Devani is right. Buying land in Judea and Samaria is really the historic mission of the Jewish National Fund. And that is a bottom line. It started a little over 100 years ago, and it's still true. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, this is Jay Shapiro. If you love Israel News Talk Radio, then you'll love our Facebook page. We keep you up to date on what's happening in Israel, plus little surprise treasures that we don't share on the radio. Go now to follow us on Facebook. Just look for the Israel News Talk Radio Facebook page. And don't forget to subscribe and follow us by clicking on the like button. We post great stuff there that you'll want to share. Israel News Talk Radio on Facebook and Israel News Radio on Twitter. If you're hearing this message, everyone else can too. Advertise with Israel News Talk Radio and get your message out to people. We'll build a personalized package for you. Contact advertising at IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Straight talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Hey, this is Jake in Anchorage, Alaska, and I love listening to all the super interesting interviews and up-to-date information on what's happening in Israel. Hello, this is Anna King, originally from London, now living in Israel. And what can I say? Israel News Talk Radio is my cup of tea. My name is Bhaskar. I'm from India, and I love listening because you get to know the truth and wonderful voices from this lovely country. Mom! Okay, wait a minute. Hi, this is Chava Dax, and I'm calling for the rolling hills of Malaya Dumim, just north of Jerusalem. I always listen to Israel News Talk Radio to get all the latest news and commentary and to keep me up to date every day. This is Sarah Dax from Malaya Dumim, and I'm 12. I wish Israel News Talk Radio was boring so my mom wouldn't listen to it all the time. Mom! You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio.